Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin V Media Podcast. Today, I'll be discussing The Holdovers with my guest, Jack Martin, editor-in-chief of Film Feeder, which uh, showcases, and let me know if I get this wrong, Jack, reviews, <laughs> previews, trailers, and advice on a wide berth of UK film releases. And speaking of Film Feeder, I know you just started your own uh, podcast for Film Feeder, the Film Feeder podcast. That's, cor- that's correct. Yeah. yeah, look, it's just launched. We're recording this the day after New Year's Day, and it launched on New Year's Day. I felt it was a appropriate enough time to launch something to real. You know, just the fact that it's out there now. I've been talking about doing it for so long, and all the feedback I've gotten so far has been really positive. I've loved hearing people saying, "Oh, it's actually quite insightful." Because you're you pretty much nailed it on the head. The only thing I don't cover is trailers, <laughs> but I do weekly roundups the the newest releases coming to UK cinemas as well as coming to streaming on demand. And I also do like my regular uh, reviews as well, where I just uh, write and put my thoughts out to the universe, as it were. So hopefully <laughs> that all it, comes uh, across in the podcast as well. It really does feel like just spewing words out into the universe sometimes. Hey, will people actually read this? Who knows? Yeah, I, I mean, it's worked for me so far. I've been doing it for 10 years. So the Film Vida stuff only just now gotten to that point where I can do uh, more with it. So this is me doing more of it. And I'm excited to be on this podcast. I've certainly taken a look at what you do and you do it very well. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, on the first podcast of the year, no less. But another thing I don't want to miss out on is you also started a Patreon for film feeder. So I'll have a link in the description for that for anyone who wants to go check that out. Um, yeah. And and for, and for anyone who's listening, it's uh, patreon.com slash film feeder. And uh, you can go there and subscribe and uh, you get a lot, bunch of exclusives. Like you get access to podcast episodes, 24 hours hours before they're available anywhere else. And you can also submit a question for uh, an upcoming Q and A sessions during the episodes so that's all fun you can even suggest topics that i cover because every week i also do a little feature presentation i like to call them where i just talk about something uh, within film culture that i find interesting whether it's a list of films coming out or some essential films from an actor or a filmmaker or even celebrating like iconic cinemas from across the world or talking about a film that's celebrating an anniversary so it's a wide variety of things and on patreon you can have the opportunity to suggest topics i'll be covering in the future so yeah patreon.com slash film feeder hope you managed to sign up and yeah and it's really easy to join too i joined for free uh, as soon as i found it is there anything you want to recommend it could be a movie tv show a video game a album there's one that definitely sticks out to mind i don't know if uh, many people in the u.s heard about this but this was a uk release from last year and i really loved it it was my recent list of the top five films of the year so it's a film called scrapper if you've not heard of it, it's a featured debut of writer director charlotte regan it's a film about a young girl played by an ex excellent young actor lola campbell lives on her own after the death of her mother but she's quite cunning she the social services into thinking she's living with an adult really she's living on her own then one day out of the blue a guy played by harris dickinson turns out to be her father the film is a series of events where they bond and she learns to process her grief better with him around her accepting this new parental figure into her life it's wonderfully made it does a lot of really fun idiosyncratic things like it'll have interviews with characters saying oh, don't like That's this person cool. for whatever reason and there's even some well, when they're running away from the authorities like ultimatum style so that was really, really cool similar to the holdovers which we'll be talking about momentarily it's just a nice little film it doesn't good dive into any of those typical kitchen sink tropes where everything's horrid and just miserable all the time now this is a really lively energetic funny and just ultimately heartwarming film so that's my recommendation it's scrapper i don't know where it's available in the us but over here in the uk i think it's available on the dvd blu-ray and i think other places as well so yeah de- definitely check that out wherever you can yeah, that's on my list. And the streaming service, I think, is Paramount Plus with Showtime, specifically. 
because oh, I also ahead. want to point out the cin- the cinematographer on the film is Molly, Man- Molly Manning Walker, who also had quite a good debut this year with How to Have Sex. That's the film that debuted at Cannes. It won the Uncertain Regard, and that's available on Mubi at the moment, I believe. I don't know if it's the same in the US. No, I think in the US it's about to have its debut at Sundance, yeah. I believe. But in the UK it's on Mubi, and it, it's tough watching. It's a very different film to Scrapper. It's not as lively or heartwarming, but it, that's a whole topic for another time. But yeah, Scrapper is my recommendation. That's awesome. I, I have a bookmark folder labeled 2023 <laughs> Cash Up, the list of 50 or so titles of m- movies or TV shows. That's on the good old Google Chrome bookmark. My hard stop for last year's movies is February because uh, some limited leases are going wide, like I'm sure Zone of Interest and um, Four Things. But yeah, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. I've got uh, Paramount Plus. I'm looking at Letterboxd over here. Gosh, I'm going to say Gran Turismo based on a true story or whatever the full name of it is. It depends on which poster you kind of look <laughs> at. I'm not a big Gran Turismo person, but I do love video games. This came out on Netflix on the 15th of last month. So I thought, hey, I'm going to check it out. It, what, what's the worst that could happen? I click off of it or something. And this decently surprised me. I think one note I wrote down while watching it was it slowly transitioned from, oh, that's a really good video game movie to, oh, no, this is a good racing movie. There's a, a lot of clever CG techniques. Some of it's corny, where it's at one point he's racing in Gran Turismo and the car like d- develops around his little gaming rig. That was a little cheesy, but but the more it goes on, it that lessens, and you get cool like helicopter racing shots, drone shots. The closest comparison I can to would be Ford v Ferrari. Le Mans 66 you're up it, it reminds me a lot of that film so if you like racing movies and you're not really sure about video game movies I'd say check this out because I feel like it does both jobs well yes it's a video game adaptation it moves things up to modernize it the guy that the film is based on who was a stunt driver for the movie the Championship Gran Turismo 5, which was 2013, 2014. But this one, because PlayStation's involved with it, they're like, oh, hey, Gran Turismo 7. With that said... Yeah, pretty cool suggestion. I I think the movie um, is fine. It it does the conventional sports movie stuff. It's a decent offering from Neil Blomkamp, who District 9 hasn't had that much uh, going on. But this was a nice little fun throw a movie to enjoy and i think it's gotten a bit of a bad rap it's not as bad as some people are making out to be and considering like last year video game movie wise we had the super mario brothers movie on in movies bad. and last of us on tv i think honestly it's pretty decent that we've had three at all video game movies that were like this recommendable <laughs> let's be honest yeah like on that same playstation productions note oh and twisted metal too which I still need to go oh, see. Yeah. But it makes me excited to see what they do with Horizon whenever that comes out. I think that's on going to be on Amazon or something like that. So, But yeah, go check it out. It's on Netflix. But with that said, let's get to our discussion of the holdovers. So f- I guess first things first, I'll start with the question I ask everyone. What did you think about this movie initially? Alexander Payne is a filmmaker. He's only as good as the script allows him to be, which is weird because sometimes he does is credited as a co-writer on his films. But this one, it's got a screenplay by David Hemmingson, who's also a producer on the film. And I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest, this was a film that I didn't really know much about going in. I knew certain things about it. I knew who was making it, who was in it. I I just didn't know what the overall vibe would be because his last film, Downsizing, was a really massive disappointment for many because obviously it was pretty bad. I don't know about you, but did you find like parts of it like slightly racist as well? I I don't know. I've I've had this weird feeling ever since I saw it, like the... What's her name? Oh. Hong Chao, yes. The Hong Chao character. She's a good actor, but I felt like the character she was 
portraying, which was this Vietnamese kind of one leg, was she one legged in that? Something about it just rubbed me the wrong way. And Hong Chao did a fine performance, but there was something about that character that felt very stereotypical for me. And I didn't feel comfortable watching that. It was a very misguided and very, it's, I've heard it be described as pretentious Ant Man. And that's pretty much all I can I think mean, about now. Well, yeah. So anyway, downsizing was pretty bad. And so I go into the holdovers thinking, I don't know what I'm going to get. It's got Paul Giamatti in it. Obviously, Sideways is great. And by my surprise, it's it, it, it was absolutely wonderful. Like, this is, the holdovers is just such a warm bear hug of a movie. Like, it's a film that has its heart in all the right places. It's a film that really puts you in such a loving, joyous mood. And it's a great Christmas movie at that. Like, yeah. it's not over, it's not due to come out in the UK until January 19th, I believe, in a couple of weeks anyway. Okay. And I feel they really missed a trick by not releasing it more around Christmas time because it's, it is a genuinely good Christmas movie. Like, it, it, it's got all the like regular iconography and it's very pretty looking with the snow well, I mean, and everything it's mm. set during christmas break so come on but yeah. you release it into january and now you're coming at the tail end of what the movie is set at so it's weird my guess is that when a universal who's handling distribution when they were like scheduling the film they, and they saw oh it's the new alexander payne movie he's done some awards uh, contenders in the past maybe we can put this out around january when we usually tend to release the oscar movies uh, in the yeah. uk and I, I imagine they didn't realize that christmas plays a huge part of the, in that in that movie so yeah i think in hindsight they're probably regressing it so yeah a holdovers is, is just is absolutely wonderful I, i'm really looking forward to seeing it again like it's a film that i've not really gotten out of my mind since watching it. It's just from how just lovely and charming it is. What did you think of it? Yeah, I I similarly went in with almost no expectations other than I believe I've had a few people on the podcast talk about it. And the one photo they released of Paul Giamatti screaming in a classroom or something like that. The one that's like uh, the end of the trailer? Was it? Yeah, that one. Yeah. The one of the free screen. Oh. Yeah. That one. Great. <laughs> and so I really had no context. And to bring it back to Alexander Payne, Downsizing, I think, is the only movie I saw of his prior to Holdovers. Mm. Um, so when I got a screener for it, I was just like, oh, I, I need to see this. And I don't think it has gone out of my mind. You talked about that a little bit. Because mm. at least once a day, I'm putting on the soundtrack, at least one of the songs from the soundtrack, because it's just rolling around in my head. But yeah, it, it's just such a wonderfully wonderful movie to watch around this time of year, even towards the beginning of the year, because it feels like a warm hug. And I think part of that has to do with not just the music that is very 70s, because it is set in the 70s. Uh, I think it's set in December 1970. And you just get that retro feel that feels like almost like you're watching an old Christmas movie. Christmas story. I'm going to get so much flack when my mom hears that. But but yeah, it just feels like that kind of vein of Christmas movie. And Alexander Payne, he would say, oh, it's not a Christmas movie, but it is. And I think it just allows the character, or the actors to just lean into what they like to do. Paul Giamatti is known for being a curmudgeonly person and just saying what he wants. And he does that here. And you've got the first time Dominic Sassa. Dominic Sassa, yeah. What, who just gets, listen out for his name because he's going to be huge after this. Yeah, I can't remember if he's nominated at the Spirit Awards or not because that's the main reason I watched it was to get my Spirit Awards voting and it was catch up because we didn't get the holdovers here where I'm at because I live in a very rural area so we barely get indie movies. Yeah, Paul Giamatti, Divine Joy Randolph is great in this. Mm -hmm. Everyone's just, it, it's just a movie I think Everyone can watch. I think I said in my review it, that it bridges the gap between people like you and I who watch a lot of movies and say, oh, this is really great. And target that gap between that and the people who annoyingly, in my mind, say that there's no original ideas in Hollywood anymore. 
I, I think that's what I ended up saying in my review because it's just that mm-hmm. kind of cozy movie that I think a lot of people think that isn't being made anymore. Yeah, I think you're right. There are no new ideas, but it's how you use them that matters. When you break it down, it, it's the kind of formula where we have two people put together, they don't get along, but then they slowly start to build a friendship. You've seen that kind of formula done plenty of times, and this movie does it well. But what I love about this movie is just how you genuinely get to see the progression of how closer... Oh, obviously they start out, and he's this curmudgeon kind of stick in the mud teacher who no one really likes and Cesar's character Angus he is the kind of guy who's just angry he's got every right to be as you learn later on in the film uh, but, he, but he's, he's not really found an outlet to channel all that rage and he just takes it out on whoever he sees fit and uh, that includes uh, Paul Giamatti and uh, some of the other students that he's initially uh, held over with as the film goes on and you see this bond kind of forming between them it, it, it gets to a point where you, you genuinely understand why these two pain in the asses would get along together in a world that literally neglected them obviously dominic sessa has been pretty much cut out from his family at this point because uh, his mum's gone on holiday with a new husband and so he's got nowhere to go and then Paul Giamatti is just an outsider. He's a bit of an abrasive personality and no one really likes him. And then also Divine Joy Randolph as well. There's a lot of things going on with her. She's probably not as curmudgeon as the other two, but she's got her own issues. And the fact that she's grieving her son who was killed in Vietnam. It's a film about these three characters who have in their own way been cast out of society and in this rough situation just coming together and forming this surrogate family of sorts. They have their own quarrels and stuff, but like any other family, and it's very smart. Over time, you really see the connection between these characters and want them to bring out the best in each other. So that's what I love about it. And I think it's, they hurl insults at each other like family does too, which Mm. I thought was a nice touch. It's like, I think there's a scene in which uh, Paul Giamatti's character and Tully um, are uh, eating something, and they they both say, "Oh, this again!" And she's like, "We, what food do you want? This isn't like the Hilton or something." She says something along those lines, uh, which I, I I found hilarious because it's like, "Yeah, you're a holdover. You're not even supposed to be here at this time. You're supposed to be with your family. What did you expect? A banquet or something like that?" But go ahead. And it's really, it's really funny because obviously there's a lot of humor in this. I think the script, again, by David Hebbingson was wonderfully done because, you know, again, there's so much naturalism to it. Like, and it doesn't really feel scripted. And it sounds weird, I know, but it, it all feels authentic. Like, it feels like these very wit- uh, verbose lines, especially from Paul Giamatti, they feel natural coming out of these people. And it's just uh, who these characters are. Paul Giamatti he has a great way of words within this movie. And it's wonderful to see him just unload such a vocabulary of insults onto anyone that uh, he feels worthy of them. So there's a line near the end, which I won't give away here because it's a spoiler, but it, it is just perfection and just how much of a put down it is. Yeah, there's even something early on where this student, before they go away for the holiday, is questioning why he got such a bad grade. And he's, I'm confused. And he says something about, I think I could do much better on this paper if we get a, another chance. And he's, oh, I don't think you can, or something to that effect. I think that line's in the trailer. Like, oh, I can't yeah. fail this class. No, I assure you, I, I definitely believe you can. It's such a brilliantly written movie. And it's, you know, I haven't seen many Alexander Payne movies. I've seen a few, like about Schmidt, Sideways, of course, uh, The Descendants, uh, Nebraska. And I haven't seen Election or, or any of the others. And, and then and there's Downsizing. But this is definitely one of the best scripts he's worked with i think it's just full of really human energy and it's got so much heart to spare and it's just a film that i really hope does take off i hope it does become like a new christmas movie this time next year because i think it's a film that just really reminds people of just how good we need to be to each other because it's Mm -hmm. really all about that 
Yeah. What are the holidays really about? It's about your family and in this case, found family, which mm-hmm. I thought was, it, it just had a way of going about it that I thought was really nice that it felt natural. Like you said earlier, um, like when they start fighting inevitably because you, know, you have act two and then you've got to have the denouement. Sorry, theater teachers everywhere. But when they start fighting inevitably, it, you feel like, oh, hey, don't fight. That feels weird to me because I'm used to you being so good towards each other. Yeah, no, it feels like a realistic fight that, you, that like you said, actual families and surrogate families would have. Like then there's like animosity like towards the beginning of the movie because obviously there's still that teacher student relationship but mm-hmm. like I said, it does evolve into something more meaningful and uh, by the time the third act comes around yeah you fully believe that these people have genuinely bonded over this very short amount of time like it's like a two-week break something i think like they that, have yeah. for christmas new year so it's not that long when you think about it but just Developing something in that amount of time is miraculous in and of itself, but it's just these very different souls who have just come together under the least desirable circumstances and really making the most of it. And that's what I really love about it. Yeah. And I think speaking of things we loved about it, I, when I was going back to do research for the review, you know, you have the Kodak logo at the beginning, but I thought, oh, that's just like a styling thing, like how they created a fake. Focus Features logo. And There's I, even like a little MPAA rating card at the beginning of it. Yeah, I thought that yeah. was awesome. Because I, I should mention, I did see this on the big screen. It's not out here in the UK until January 19th, but I was able to see this at the BFI London Film Festival back, back in Ooh. October. Yeah, it's one of the big mainstays on the festival calendar and a bunch of this year's films, uh, with, including The Holdovers. And setting this out in this big auditorium and then the film stock kind of stuff just goes on the screen it's actually quite f- fun to see in a film made nowadays because a lot of films they tend to try and replicate that kind of old feel but most of them never really get the aesthetic quite right it always feels still very modern but this feels like something that could genuinely have come from the 1970s and would have been considered a classic then as well and i feel the film stock really added that kind of nice little layer on top of it you you definitely get used to it but Mm -hmm. it's a nice little touch and and a film that's just full of sweet little touches like that yeah i was trying to see what the film stock was oh kodiak vision 2383 that's what it was filmed on oh sweet and then when not all projectors still have film slots so when that isn't available they use the 2k digital intermediate but but yeah i just thought that was a nice touch even through watching it through a a monitor it was very apparent that it just felt i think it loops back to the thing of i think there's a very conscious choice when this was being developed whether that's been years or however long to make it feel as 70s as possible down to the music down and it extends to the film stock. So I thought that was an, a neat trick. Just further sell the audience immersion. Yeah, definitely. It gives it the feel of one of those new Hollywood movies from that era. Like uh, you could see uh, someone like Michael Cimino or Francis Ford Coppola making something like not as comedic. I can imagine someone like Cimino yeah. would have just really went all out with the aesthetic and lost touch of what the heart of the story is, uh, like I did with Heaven's Gate. But I, I feel that um, there's a lot of respect for just the old kind of mm, filmmaking in ways that aren't necessarily, yeah, yeah, you feel nostalgic while watching it, but it's not like that's all you're thinking of when you're watching it. Seeing like a film stock in a 2023 film is cool and everything, but you're there because the characters are so great and the writing is so witty and charming and the performances are excellent all around. It, it's a very well-crafted film. Like I think a lot of what I've noticed a lot of critics reviews and even some awards is that the cinematography in this movie is underrated. I think there's yeah. a, just a nice simplicity to uh, all, all these kind of at snowy uh, towns like at the beginning of the film that's set to the choir and there's a really great shot about the halfway point it takes place at a party and it involves paul giamatti's character he's just looking 
glam while everything's going on in the background where he's just fully in focus and it's just mm-hmm. focused on his face it's a very understated piece of cinematography and it just perfectly captures the mood of the scene and what the character's feeling so well and i feel get much credit for it the cinematographer on this was i'm just checking my notes here Egil brill oh my god i can't pronounce that name I probably butchered the hell out of that cinematographer's name and somehow listening to this. But he did a great job with this. And I feel, yeah, it doesn't really get much credit in talking about this film. Yeah. And what I love too is on that same note of the cinematography, and 18 and 35 millimeters are pretty well used. Sometimes you'll use a 24, but the color grading matched up too to the what the scene was trying to convey. And I know that's something that I think people take for granted. But in that same scene, everything's just this yellow hue to it. Whereas you're at Barton Academy, everything's just white and very bright, right? Mm. Um, And then you get out into the city and you get these bluish tones to it, to the color grading. I think when I sit down to review something, I'm like, okay, am I looking at the whole picture or am I just trying to skim? Um, so hopefully, I just hope that people take a closer look at the cinematography because something very, I know a lot of people did with the creator because that was shot on the FX3, but really Mm. when you look at that, the color grading is also really subtle, but if if you look at it for enough time, it'll just sell what the mood I'm supposed to be having here. What is the tone? Yeah, no, I think a very good way of putting it. It's pretty to look at. A lot of Alexander Payne's usual styles, he's got this quirky sense of humor. He likes to camera zooms or shots of people. There's a funny gag towards the beginning of the movie. Paul Giamatti is just choking on his pipe, and it's just the most perfectly thing. I'm laughing like that was hilarious. And that's just like kind of sideways or the descendants. There it is, but a very droll way of conveying everything. And it's very much on display here. And at times it can be really funny, not just from the dialogue, but just from how Alexander Payne just frames certain shots and scenes. It's it's quite ingenious the more I think about it. I haven't actually seen it since back in October, so I'm probably forgetting a lot of things. And I'm eager to see it again, just because I know there's a lot of stuff about it that I really appreciate on the second time. One of the things I uh, noted in my original review for it was the only real gripe I had with it was the fact that I feel like it started to run out of steam towards the end. I don't know if you got this as well. Did you feel like there was a certain point in the third act was just like, okay, you can start to wrap up now. It doesn't need to carry on this much. Yeah, I'll just say when to a certain town, like you'll know when you get there, when you see the movie. But when they get there, I'm like, okay, come on. We, We don't need an extra 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah, that, I, I, that was at that point where I started to feel maybe this is getting a bit indulgent, but it was still gripping me because the character work was still very good. I felt like if you cut a little bit out, it would have been tighter. Overall, I think the editor did a very good job. Far be it from me or any of us to really tell an editor how to do his job. I'm only just going off personal stuff. I felt like at that point, during the third act, it started to run out of steam. That's really the only gripe, because there's so much about this movie that works perfectly. It's funny, it's smart, it's it's heartwarming, and it's filled with warmness that is just... You don't see much in the other awards contenders that are go, going up for the big Oscar prize, because I'm sure this is going to be nominated for Best Picture, and it, it's got a lot of love from other awards bodies moment as well i can see it doing very well at the oscars the nominations at least but yeah i think is it's a really great film i think it's one of alexander's and i think it's one of alexander payne's best quite honestly at least yeah, his best I, in a while yeah i've only seen downsizing so i have that compa- to compare it to bar definitely check out uh, his other films because i guarantee you they're a lot better than downsizing <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually planning to go, but I'm probably going to watch Sideways after I watch The Holdovers mm. again. But going back to editing, I did feel like it dragged a little bit. 
However, I the one thing I did like before that point hit, I think I appreciated how much the editor, Kevin Tent, let it breathe. Because he takes a much more observational approach to this movie. And I noted a similarity to something like Network, THX 1138, Alien, where you're just looking, the way it's framed is that you're just like, you're an onlooker like if you're passing them on the street. And yeah, I, I just appreciated that. So but I, yeah, need to, I need to see it. Definitely planning on seeing it again. Uh, and there was also just mixing the editing and the cinematography. There's a great scene where it starts on a close up of Sessa's face. Mm-hmm. And then it just slowly pans back as he's laying into some of, some of the backstory. It, it, it's quite profound because the performance is great, but it's also the way that the cinematographer is uh, framing it and how neatly it's paced through the editing and, of course, how Alexander Payne sees it through the actual lens. It's a very understated shot because it's honing in on this character's feelings as he's delivering this monologue about the kind of stuff that's been going on in his life. And it, 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 it's, it's a very powerful moment that is true to the spirit of the film, which is just to really see more to this person than it initially seems, because they start and they have very two-dimensional views of each other and then come to realise, oh, actually, there's much more going on than they would have figured. So that's what I loved about it. Yeah, for sure. And I think the hallway shot is going to, be one that sticks with me for a while. You know what I'm talking about? Hmm. So Since I've seen it, so forgive me for my hat memories. The teacher, Hunnam, is chasing Tully, and the way hmm. how smoothly it's shot and then it ends on a upshot of Paul Giamatti's face, which in the trailer, I, I just thought it, it's so smooth that deserves special mention. But yeah, I, I think everyone should go see this. Whether if you've got it in theaters, go see it that way because I'm go- willing to bet that my 1080p stream is going to look a lot worse, especially if you've got it. Maybe I don't know if theaters are listing whether they're playing it in Kodak film or digital anymore, but I'm sure it's still in theaters. I know oh. here they just put it on Peacock in the US um, on the 29th, mm. is when they put it on there. It just came out on Blu-ray today, so really you've got three different ways to watch it. That was false. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it was weird. because yeah, Didn't it really just come out like a couple of months ago? Yeah, November, something. I, was, I, I, know, I know like the window between theatrical and home viewing is much shorter than it was, but I didn't know it was that quick. My... For focus, it's like this. It's like microscopic. If you don't catch it in the theater, it, it's you look at Peacock and, oh, it's already on there. And then... Uh, a few weeks later, it's, oh, and it's on Blu-ray, and I can rent it if I don't have Peacock. So that's the one thing I do about Peacock, and probably the reason I'll keep it for as long as they keep doing this. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have Peacock in the UK. I think it's uh, like a subsidiary of Sky or Now TV or something like that. That This is a kind of film that even if people don't see this in the cinema, I imagine that this time next year there will be a lot of people who will be discovering this film for the first time and just and immediately putting it in the um, catalogue of modern Christmas movies that are actually good. Like none of that Hallmark Christmas movie uh, vibes or whatever. No, this is a genuinely the Christmas miracle part two. well-constructed Christmas miracle part two. I, I imagine this will be uh, on the list in terms of something like Christmas Story, like you mentioned earlier, or other film Christmas films from around that. Hey, what happened there? I have no idea. You you just start talking and then it just froze. Oh, yeah. I have no idea what happened there. So, uh, do, do you want me to start again? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll mute myself yeah, just yeah, in case course. that causes any issues. Yeah, I can definitely see this film being mentioned in a year's time about just the kind of modern Christmas classics that people tend to put on around that time of year. Families have stuff like Elf, Muppet Christmas Carol... And older viewers have uh, more unconventional stuff like Die Hard, Christmas Vacation, or Gremlins. I feel that this is a nice in-between. Family, I think families can enjoy it. I know it's rated R in the US, there are 15 over here. But I think it, it's, it's nothing overly offensive. I think that families can watch 
something like the holdovers with kids and they'll come out perfectly fine the other end i think in the same way that gremlins was you, you watch that movie and it had as dark as it is i feel like a lot of kids can handle stuff like that because we tend to underestimate kids and how much they can uh, tolerate some pretty uh messed up stuff so uh, nothing as messed up as gremlins happens in the holdovers but i feel like the ultimate sense of heart and family which are essential over christmas will resonate with a lot of people and yeah i think it's destined to become like uh, the next big christmas film that everyone puts on around that time of year yeah it's already in my list i, I made a list around christmas <laughs> time because i was bored and i am one of those people who has christmas vacation on my christmas list i actually watched it on christmas yeah, it was like on TNT or one of the movie channels. Maybe it was BBC. Maybe that was uh, it. Is that your go-to Christmas movie? Christmas Vacation? Always. If, if it's not that, <laughs> it's Elf. If we don't see one of those uh, my, two, my, something's wrong. Yeah, my one has always been Muppet Christmas Carol. And there's just, just something so joyous about it it's by far the best adaptation of that story ever put to film because yeah, it's the muppets it's michael kane it's amazing but yeah i imagine that i need to see muppets christmas carol you haven't seen it oh you've got I a whole know. year to prepare for it then with the holdovers it, it's a surprisingly good double feature with the holdovers <laughs> yeah next year i'm considering re-adding they made a, a mickey version a mickey's christmas carol oh I'm yeah about Mickey, adding mickey's that christmas back carol. in yeah. Hmm. It was definitely the first one of that particular story I saw. And there's stuff about it that still, I remember like the, the ending with Pete as a uh, Christmas present. Like that, that kind of stuff was quite uh, horrifying when you think about yeah. it. The Muppet version is not as, not as dark, uh, although it definitely gets the ghost of Christmas present in that movie is pretty much like a Dementor from the Harry Potter movies. But it's great because it's not like any of the existing Muppets. Like they created whole new Muppets for those roles, which I thought was very cool to see. Uh, yeah, I, great. Now I'm thinking about, oh, maybe they'll put the Muppets into the holdovers. I could see Gonzo Jimmy Kimmel being Dominic hosting. Sessa. Or... If you think that ain't, isn't going to be the opening skit, I don't know what to tell you. It's going to happen somehow. Kimmel's definitely going to incorporate something with holdovers, or I imagine he'll probably do something with Barbie or Oppenheimer. <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited. I do like Jimmy Kimmel, so I think he's, he does well at the Oscars. So I'm excited to see what he does this year. I'm on the opposite side of the fence, but one more Christmas movie I want to mention. That is an unconventional Christmas movie. Also a Disney okay. movie, That's by it. the way. Oh, and yeah. also one I grew up with. A Tigger movie. Oh! That's a deep cut. I, I never really considered it like Christmas movie as such. I saw it when I was a kid too, but I remember usually obviously like the big snow stuff and everything, but I never yeah. really associated it with Christmas. So yeah, that's me... not a bad show. So Honestly, here's not my a bad pitch. show. Because mm -hmm. Tigger is, well, I think he gets a letter from his family who we never knew and mm. has never been talked about in the Winnie the Pooh's series the show was on disney channel i don't know you never knew family was but everyone else had a family movie centers on oh he has a letter from his family uh he's gonna go out and find his family and then he gets stuck in the snow uh and then it ends with oh we're piglet and you know t uh, all of us here in the hundred acre where would are your family you just didn't realize it Obviously, mm. the snow scene you talk about, he goes wandering off in the snow because he thinks nobody believes in him. And yeah, just maybe that's a good pairing with the holdovers, actually. Tigger movie and the well, you never you, you never know. Tigger's just entered the public domain. So maybe someone will actually genuinely make like a holdovers remake with Tigger and such did it for some reason. <laughs> I'm on the job. Well, maybe they'll just do something slasher related because that apparently happens all the time when characters enter the public domain. Like they just really announced like today. two with Mickey Mouse and Steamboat Willie. That it's just insane. happened today. Yeah. With a horror movie did, and yeah. then I mean, uh, yeah. Like Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey apparently wasn't enough. Yeah. Crazy. Now we got to get the. What would a Tigger killer movie be? Like what, Tig? killer or something I mean, like that he, he just bounces on people he bounces uh, on people to death i don't know yeah but the worst uh, ways um, to go. yeah look up the boys for 
bad ways to go. The endless <laughs> montage of all those scenes. Um, but anyways, um, so yeah, if you want to check out the holdovers, at least in the U.S., um, uh, in theaters, uh, streaming on Peacock. I think you have to have um, Peacock Premium um, to stream the the new movies. Uh, it, it's either Premium or Premium Plus. I whatever which one it is. Um, and then, of course, if you don't want to yeah, lock yourself into a streaming, you can obviously rent it on a, um, Apple TV, um, Voodoo, Google TV. But yeah, probably Redbox has it too. But in the UK, you said January 19th? Yeah, January 19th is uh, the release for the holdovers. So yeah, that comes out the same day as a bunch of other stuff. You know, you've got the Book of Clarence coming out the same day as well. And we start from both of which also played at the London Film Festival. It'll be an interesting triple feature, to say the least, because uh, I bet I guarantee you that not many of them will be quite as wholesome as the holdovers. Yeah. And speaking of the London Film Festival, check out the London Film Festival podcast where Latoya talked about the holdovers. I think she saw it at the same screening you were at actually but yeah that, oh, i think yeah. that's where we first mentioned it on the podcast and then of course i've got a review of the holdovers on the website that'll be linked in the podcast show notes below i don't know if i can link the article in the youtube description but it'll be in the show notes and on the website and then yeah just rent it stream it or go to a theater i personally recommend going to a theater but you know do whatever you need but I am looking forward to checking out Book of Clarence. Maybe I'll get somebody on for that. I know I've got somebody coming on for talking about Spider-Man 2 in about a week or so. The game, not the movie. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to be talking best of 2023 sometime in February. With that said, everyone, thanks for listening to the podcast. I've been your host, uh, Austin Belzer. If you've enjoyed this episode, you, uh, you can subscribe to it leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. You can follow me on social media at Austin B media on blue sky, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon and threads. And then if you fancy letterboxd, I'm on there at Austin B movies. Jack, where can people follow you? I am on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, all those places as the handle film feeder on Instagram. It's a little bit different because film feeder was taken. So I've now got film feeder in I N S T A. I'm also on blue sky. You can find me there. And uh, also I am on letterboxd, which is just film feeder as well. So yeah, I hope to see you there. Yeah, I'll see you there, but thank you so much for coming on Jack. I hope to talk to you again soon, maybe about something else. Maybe we'll have you on next year for London film festival 2024 or something like that. Yeah, and obviously, love love to have you as a guest on uh, the Film Feeder podcast as well, uh, hopefully in the future. Yeah, fingers crossed. I'll, just let me know. Absolutely. Keep you in mind for anything that's coming up. But until then, it's been a real pleasure being here. Thank you very much for having me. And those who are listening or watching, I hope I wasn't too rambly. <laughs> no, you were fine. But thank you so much. There you go. I'm your film chef extraordinaire, Jack Martin, and I'm here to whet your appetite for film every week. Thank you for having me, and hope you get to see the holdovers.